When aspiring game developers ask more experienced people where to start, the answer is usually something along the lines of, learn Python, it's simple and versatile. Watch some Unity tutorials, it has a massive community and you can't possibly fail. Try blueprints, no coding involved. Recreate Tetris in C++. Yeah, if that doesn't make you want to quit. Now, maybe learning programming was just more difficult for me than it is for the average Joe, but I feel like there are far more accessible places to begin. I didn't really start learning programming till I used Scratch, so that's always an easy recommendation from me. Seriously, try it. But there are other supposedly great tools out there that I never see people recommend, and I often wonder why. In the summer of 2021, Nintendo released Game Builder Garage for the Nintendo Switch, an application promising newcomers the ability to utilize the Switch's hardware to learn the basics of game development and create some games of their own. Now. I'm a game development beginner, uh, have been for 8 years, so I figured I'd be qualified to review such a product from that perspective. Kind of. To learn the pros and cons of the app and decide whether or not this is something I'd recommend to those interested in the field of game development. So without further ado, let's open the garage. Game Builder Garage strikes a great first impression. Right off the bat, you have bright colors, bopping music, a clean interface, and a glance at some fun characters whom you are soon to meet. You also only have one option, interactive lessons. I like how simple they kept it all. No weird dials, settings, pop-ups, or anything like that. Keeps the complexity focused on the actual programming, as opposed to menu navigation. I respect that. When you do unlock the free programming option after completing the first tutorial, it also presents itself as a simplistic menu, with your games, some navigation tools, and options for making, taking, and sharing games. Also Alice's Guide, which we'll be getting into later. It's all very reminiscent of the Mario Maker games. Big surprise there. It all works together to create a very enticing creative atmosphere. And now that the game has enticed you, there is but one place to begin. Literally. One button. The tutorial begins with this little platforming section where, shocker, the program isn't finished and the jump button doth not work. Once you've come to the logical conclusion that the game is pulling your leg and walk forward, you meet Bob, one of two instructors in the game, the other being Alice. These characters may not have faces, but they certainly have personality. Bob is the gung-ho, ready-to-roll teacher who's pumped to see the game come to life as quick as possible, whilst Alice is the more reserved and collected one that is more interested in making sure you understand the complex capabilities of each instruction. She also hijacks Bob's lessons sometimes, which is really not cool. Despite resembling Ocarina of Time's Navi, they carefully avoid the annoyances of such a character through their personalities. In fact, each and every Nodon has its own personality. During the tutorials, Nodon will often have some banter with Bob and Alice or share some quick quips and puns about something related to their function. Like how the Timer Nodon is annoyed that you don't book them in advance, the Counter Nodon is obsessed with turning reality into a mathematical equation, and the Retry Nodon is constantly burdened with regrets. This can all be sped through of course, but I often found myself reading the dialogue anyways. It keeps things interesting during the more repetitive parts of development, and made the whole experience of programming feel less lonely. But wacky little characters don't mean much if they don't serve a purpose, and for my money, the teaching is effective. It starts off simple by showing you how nodes connect and how the result of that connection influences the game. It then shows you how to find and add different nodes into the game and organize them for the most efficient and readable result. There are a lot of Nodon in the game, from all your basic logic and functions to some funky gimmicky shenanigans to, um, turnips. Turnips and spades. But it goes a little deeper. Most nodes have a settings menu where you can adjust properties such as their color, their exact location, how they interact with other objects, and how they join two parent objects. And it goes even deeper, teaching you about such concepts as using an invisible sensor that only detects one kind of collision so you can make a basic car AI that knows how to avoid corners. There's potential for some pretty technical things to be created, but what I really liked is that the fundamental stuff works right out of the box. The player moves forward, backward, left, and right, not relative to the world coordinates, but to the camera view. Remember how hard that was to learn in Unity? Maybe not, maybe you haven't done that yet, but I did. And it certainly sets a daunting precedent to have something so complex be one of the first things you have to do in a 3D space. So I really appreciate that Garage just says, we'll take care of that, focus on the game juice, focus on the things that you really care about. How does an AI car work? We can learn about that. Ignore the wheel physics for now. How does a moving platform work? We have some cool sliding nodes we'll teach you about. Let's not think about the code that keeps the player from sliding right over it. How do I create the perfect arc for my jump such that it aligns with the approximate Y position of the original Super Mario Bros game? I don't know. Adjust the jump strength, that's an easy option. 
From an advanced programmer's point of view, these aren't necessarily things you want by default. Maybe you want to simulate springs for your wheels to make a bouncy ATV. Maybe you want to program the static friction of a platform by yourself so you have precise control over the physics. And maybe you like designing your own jump curve functions and coyote time setup that muddles with your code. But for most people just beginning, they don't. Game Builder Garage says, let's not get bogged down with the basic stuff. Let's do something cool. And something cool, it does. The tutorial takes you through the process of developing seven games of varying genres and quizzing you after each one. Tag Showdown, a 2D, two-player-ish game of tag with random balls that can kill you at any time. On a Roll, a top-down game in which you must tilt the controller to navigate a ball around a maze to collect apples. Alien Blaster, an auto-scrolling space shooter. Risky Run, a 2D side-scrolling game. Mystery Room, an escape room style game with one puzzle that I didn't figure out on my own because I never thought to unfold a die. Thrill Racer, a racing game with a course that looks like this. Also the AI opponent I mentioned earlier, look at him. And the big finale is Super Person World, a game that's a lot like... I don't know, it seems pretty unique. What's interesting about this one is the two instructors start arguing with each other about which idea they have for development is better, and in the end they make you choose, and no matter which one you choose, the other one will be really sad, and I don't appreciate that. It's not nice. Don't force me to make a circle sad, okay? The tutorial really holds your hand. I don't think it's possible to screw up any of the instructions. They set up the workspace view so that it's always just where you need it at just the right zoom. They tell you what note on to grab, where to put it, and they don't let you blow it. If they tell you to set the Y rotation to 90, you won't be accidentally placing it 90 feet high. It won't let you shift or delete the wrong note. It won't let you put the wrong note into your scene. It won't ever give you an instruction that you'll be stuck on for more than a few seconds. If a menu doesn't take you toward your desired note on, it simply can't be pressed. Now, as the tutorial progresses, they do provide less step-by-step -step instructions and instead say, add a chest to the scene and put it in the blue box, as opposed to leading you through each individual menu button. But they never ditch the gutter guards. Everything happens one way and one way only. This is good. This is very, very good. I started and stopped learning programming many times throughout the years, and almost every single time it was because I got really invested in a tutorial, made a mistake or missed a step, and I couldn't fix it and couldn't progress. I didn't have the skills to fix it myself, so I gave up. And until you learn how the code works, how to debug it, research it, and correct it, there's nothing you can do at that point. Restart from the very beginning? <sighs> Tough sell. Personally, I think they hit the nail on the head here. In the free programming mode, you can mess up to your heart's content, but whilst you cross Tutorial Street, you better be holding onto GBG's hand. So if that's the case, then won't new programmers start expecting everything to work first time every time? Well, that's what's clever about this program. It doesn't just set up the project to work perfectly, like so many other tutorials do. It takes you through the initial setup, the testing, and the failure, still hand in hand. You place a floor, and it falls, so Bob tells you how to fix it. You're missing a wall in your house, and now your character can escape. You add in the wall and suddenly your camera is blocked and you have to make the wall invisible. For an advanced programmer, this would be one step. Add an invisible wall. They probably would add it before they even thought about why they're adding it, because after a while these errors become so predictable. Often you don't even need to debug because the problem is so easy to recognize. I did this, this, and this, but not this, so of course this. That's a lot of logical steps for someone who's never walked up those stairs. GBG familiarizes you with these kinds of errors in a guided, intentional way, such that you learn to be aware of these problems, but aren't overwhelmed by simultaneously needing to solve them yourself. You can't answer 1 plus 2 if you haven't learned about 3 yet. The tutorial also teaches you a little about code organization through the use of features like notes and wormholes, the latter of which send code from one block to another. It's maybe not the most in-depth look at how to organize code, but it points you in the general direction. Along with that are some debugging tips like adding a text block to check the value of a variable, as well as moving the player's starting position around the level in order to skip the tedious process of walking back every time you make a change. It's not super in-depth by any means, but it does at the very least introduce these ideas. The tutorial is good. It took me about 8 hours to complete, but I get the feeling that the proper way to finish it is by making one game, going off on your own, and then coming back later to do another. Once you finish the main tutorial, you always have both a documentation menu and Alice's Guide, which provides a more in-depth look at individual Nodon and their capabilities. Game Builder Garage is certainly not lacking in the support department, and the end of the tutorial didn't leave me going, now what? Unlike pretty much every other tutorial series in existence. Alright then, you're on your own, you just created a project, what's it like? 
Naturally, you are greeted to an empty game. You click a button to switch between this screen and the editor, and every time the green screen opens, you restart from the beginning. Navigation in the editor is alright. You move around using the right stick, control the cursor with the left stick, and hold down the triggers while moving up or down to zoom. Menus are interacted with by using B, and you can select multiple node on by holding down a trigger. I'm really not a fan of using a controller for precise movement, but all things considered, Game Builder Garage does a decent job. Controls are snappy, acceleration is good, and all the node on gently snap into a grid, though you can make things look less grid-like by zooming in further and adjusting the position. Also, there is an option to plug in your mouse for this game. You still need a controller for playing the game and using certain buttons, but if you have a mouse, I'd recommend using it over the controller. It makes the already decent navigation so much nicer. Layout. There's nothing that complicated about how the UI is laid out. It's simple menus that lead to more simple menus that lead to more simple menus. It's not busy, it's clean, I can use these words over and over again, or you can just look. Now here's something interesting. The game's level designer and code editor share the same workspace, as opposed to having separate dedicated screens for each. At first I thought it was a little weird having a physical box share the same space as a constant, but generally the way things are organized leads to code being stacked in organized piles off to the side, invisible to the naked eye. The shape of the level contrasts the shape of the code and makes it clear which is which for the most part. Part of me likes this approach. Coding can get very abstract, so it's very reassuring to visually see your your work connecting to physical objects. And it's nice to have everything all in one place so you're not constantly switching between menus, windows scripts, and other nonsense just to make a few small changes. However, this leads me to my problem with the software. Mmm, yes. The problem TM. And the problem is coordinates. Now, you know me. I'm an XYZ aficionado. I understand graphing, vectors, angle math, and all that fun stuff, but I don't like how little it is explained in the tutorials considering how integral it is for design. Let's say you want one node on to be parented to another node on. Well, you'd simply drag a connection from the bottom corner of the child to the top corner of the parent. Now they're connected, la di da. But in most 3D software, they are connected as they are placed. If they are top to bottom, they move top to bottom. If they are front to side, they move front to side. And if they aren't touching, look at that. But in Game Builder Garage, you have to specify which side faces which in a settings menu. It's very unintuitive and limited in its options, but at least it's simple, right? Well, here's the catch. Let's say you want your nodons to be connected from front to back, but maybe you want one just slightly offset. Well, unfortunately, there's no offset property. You have to instead connect the object to the side of a slightly shrunken, invisible object that has then been connected to the main parent and scaled to a thin slice in order to achieve this effect. By forcing you to decompose your creation into so many pieces, it takes away your ability to really visualize the objects that you're building. While we're on the coordinates topic, you can make 3D games in this program. Platformers, first person horror, this. So naturally, if you're making a 3D game, you'd want to have several angles for viewing said game. Front, sides, top, bottom, back, or even just a nice isometric angle. Most 3D software lets you rotate the view around the object to make fine adjustments. Do you want to know how many view modes exist in this game? Two. Front and top. This is not good. For a mostly 2D or one directional game, it's easy to deal with. But once you have nodes layered on nodes at different angles and you forget which direction you're facing, it just becomes a big pain. I don't understand how this was overlooked. It makes working in 3D downright awful sometimes. The transition from one view to another is so subtle, and the node on are so abstracted from their in-game graphics that I had to redo designs several times simply because I had confused the axes. I feel like this design was intentional that they simplified the process for the sake of beginners not getting confused. And if that's the case, then I simply disagree with the decision. I don't think that reducing 3D navigation options makes it easier to make a 3D game. Now a 2D mono view game, top down, side on, etc, that's all fine and dandy to have a nice simple screen, but for 3D it's just weird. It's more complex and it's abnormal and I can't think of any modern 3D software that works with these as limitations. 3D in Scratch is easier than this. I'm sure some people are going to disagree and say that they prefer this workflow, and that's fine, it just means you're a little insane, that's all. Although it is frustrating, based on the number of high quality games I've seen made with this app, it is something that can be dealt with. And on that note, let's wrap this up. Overall, this is a very good application for learning about game development. The tutorials are well made and the engine is mostly well crafted. Would I recommend it to a beginner? Yeah, I think I would. 
Would I tell someone to go out and buy a Switch and a copy just to learn game development? Probably not. I'd go straight for scratch in that instance. But would I tell someone who already has a Switch and wants to try out game development to spend $40 on this? I think I would, but tentatively. It's not the most direct route to learning game development, it's not going to make you a programming legend or anything like that, but I strongly believe that it is a positive and welcoming way to begin learning. And I think that a lot of game development fundamentals are introduced here. If you're interested and have the cash to spend, it may be worth your while. Anyhow, I've said what I meant and meant what I said, so take it as you will and uh, make your own choice. That's all I can say about that. And that's my review of Game Builder Garage. Ciao for now.